It's nine hours. Oh, are we are we live? Okay, sorry. Um, hi, this is Carl Zha. I'm the host of the Silk and Steel podcast, and today I will be debating Bill Hayden, the former BBC journalist from Vietnam and Southeast Asia, the author of the recent book, The Invention of China. And you actually wrote a couple books on China, right? Uh, Bill, I think your previous book was on South China Sea. Yeah, and the one before that was on Vietnam. So this yeah. is my, my first book on China, really. Well, actually, before we start the debate, um, I, I, the, the reason I wanted to have this debate because I saw a, a report on your book from Sydney Morning Herald. Um, and in the article, it, it, it posited the idea that you presented um, supposedly that China itself uh, is an invented idea, a rather modern invention. Um, but in this Sydney Herald, Morning Herald article, you actually said that um, Australia is older than China. <laughs> so I, I don't know if the article presented your uh, book's idea fairly. Um, you know, I don't know if the, the title of your book, The Invention of China, is just a clickbait title. Uh, so maybe you, uh, this is your opportunity to t tell my audience um, what is your book about and what is like the, the main idea you're trying to get across. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you for the, the invitation. So I guess in Bali, you haven't been able to get a copy of the book yet, I take it. So, uh, yeah, the, the Sydney Morning Herald article was a, you know, it was a nice, uh, nice review. It didn't quite get everything right. Um, so the, the book is basically a, an argument that many of the ideas that we take about modern China today were reformed, reconstructed, invented in the late 19th and early 20th century. I'm not the first person to use this phrase, the invention of China. Uh, Lydia Liu, a few years ago, uh, her book uh, has the subtitle, The Invention of China in Modern World Making. Um, what I've tried to do is sort of make a lot of the insights from people like Lydia Liu and the New Qing History School and other people and make them sort of more accessible uh, to a, a kind of a general audience. So um, if I maybe try and share some screens, uh, some pictures with you. I think you might be sharing the, your own slides at the moment. Can I show a couple of pictures? Right, um, and then I'll uh, come back, hang on, right, so I'm gonna, right, what am I sharing? Um, right. So, um, yeah, so basically this, I mean, I. I was a reporter in Vietnam in 2006 7, uh, and then I wrote a book about Vietnam, and then that led into writing a book about uh, South China Sea. Um, and then, in the process of writing that book, um, I came to sort of realize that a lot of things that I was writing about in the South China Sea uh, were actually true of, uh, of China more generally. Um, so, can you see, am I, is my screen being shared at the moment? Which and what can you see? You see my book title things. The books. Okay. And now can you see can you see the maps now? Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay, well, UK, Bali, US, the world, five seconds, I guess, is not bad. Um, so here's an example of, of what I found. So this is the first map to show China's U-shaped uh, or you know, claim line in the South China Sea. Uh, this is from an atlas published by actually a Manchu geographer, self-taught geography professor called Bai Mei Chu. And he's really important because it was, he's the first guy who draws the line in the South China Sea like this. And it was two of his students that went on to advise the Republic of China government uh, after the Second World War to draw the official Republic of China claim line in the South China Sea. But what's really un uh, funny, weird about this is that in this map of the South China Sea, most of the islands that he draws here do not actually exist. Uh, so he invented this claim. So, for example, this here is, uh, is Chan Wei Tan. This is Zeng Mu Tan. And over here we have uh, Haima Tan. 
Um, and for those of you who speak Chinese or can understand my terrible pronunciation, you'll know that Vang, uh, Chan Wei Tan is Vanguard Bank. Uh, uh, Zengmu Tan is uh, James, the British, the English name James. And Haima Tan is uh, Seahorse uh, Shoal. Now, the great thing about these is that none of these uh, features actually exist. And yet uh, they're underwater features. And yet he drew a line around them. And this today is the Chinese claim in the South China Sea. It's completely made up. It's drawn around islands that don't actually exist. And you can see where he got the ideas from. And here I've transliterated and translated some of them. So Haima Tan here and Chan Wei Tan and Zeng Wu Tan here. And basically, he, uh, Bai Mei Chu, simply copied foreign maps. And so this may well be the map that he copied because as you can see, it mentions the James Shoal down here, Zeng Mu Tan. Here's the Vanguard Bank. And here is, uh, where's Seahorse Show? Seahorse Bank here, yeah? And as you can see, the people who drew this map in London, they put little dotted lines around them to show that these were in fact underwater features here and here and here. But Bai Mei Chu didn't understand that. So he copied this map and he drew a line around it and he colored these little blobs in as islands, claiming them to be territory and saying that they had always been Chinese territory. But what do we see when we go there? Well, here you go. Here is the, the Zengmu Ansha. Here officially is the southernmost point of Chinese territory. And this shows the ridiculousness of nationalist um, invention because all these uh, sailors and the ships are standing around a non-existent island proclaiming it to be the southernmost point of Chinese territory, Zengmu Ansha, or Zengmu Tan as it used to be called, or the James Shoal in English. And the name is just simply a transliteration or the English name uh, Zengmu, uh, James Shoal becomes Zengmu Tan, later becomes Zengmu Ansha. And you can see this actually in the Republic of China's own documents. So in 1943, while the Second World War is raging, uh, the Republic of China government produced this book about its territory, and it claimed that the southernmost point of, of China was the Paracel Islands in the northern part of the South China Sea. But in the second edition of this book, which was published in 1947, you can see in the first page, they say the sovereignty now stretches as far as the Tuansha Islands, which is then what the, the, the Chinese government called the Spratly Islands. Now, now they call them the Nansha Islands. So you see in the course of these four years, the Chinese territorial claim in the South China Sea extends south by several hundred miles. Um, no reason to do it other than that dodgy map that I showed you uh, in the last slide. And when you start to look at how the claim making was invented, and that's why I use the word, you can see that it wasn't just uh, out at sea, that some similar things were happening on land. So this is the really the first modern atlas that was produced in the Republic of China after the revolution of 1911-1912. It was produced by the newspaper called Shenbao. Um, and what you can see, of course, is a lot of interesting developments for people looking at it now. So, you know, you've got this great big chunk here, which, of course, is now most of it is now independent state of Mongolia. Um, it's, there's a claim line which goes all the way around here, even though at the time this atlas was produced in the 1930s, Tibet was completely independent. Uh, most of Mongolia was independent. Xinjiang was sort of, you know, autonomous under warlord control. And so the claim extends to these areas, even though at the time they weren't actually under the control of the central government. And yet, interestingly, Taiwan here is not colored in because in 1936, the Republic of China didn't claim Taiwan, didn't regard it as part of China and had basically forgotten about it. So this map here is proof of how ideas about territory were changed, reimagined and reinvented in the 1930s. And we can get an even better understanding of that because this is the uh, preface to that atlas. Uh, the atlas is in the School of Oriental and African Studies uh, in London. And if you look in the preface of the atlas, it tells you that the reason that the Shunbao newspaper made this atlas was because they had tried to organize an expedition to the frontiers of the Republic in 1920 to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the newspaper. Um, but they didn't actually know where the frontiers of the country were. Uh, they had no accurate map. And so they asked uh, an expert geographer, Mr. Ding Wenjiang, and said, you know, where are the frontiers? And he said, we don't know. Uh, no one has produced a complete and accurate map of the entire country. So when you think now that there are people literally beating one another to death in the Himalayan mountains uh, or getting upset about uh, other bits of the frontier, 
uh, because it's sacred, eternal, always fixed land. Just go back and look at this atlas and you'll realize that even in the 1930s, the Republic of China didn't know where its frontiers were. They hadn't been properly mapped. Uh, and it was a work of fiction, a work of invention. And even the word territory, and this is where I kind of get into the meat of the book. So a word like territory didn't exist in Chinese before the 1890s. Uh, it actually comes, the English word is translated into Japanese, and then the Japanese term is then uh, used in Chinese with obviously a different pronunciation. So it comes from the British social Darwinist, a guy called uh, Robert, uh, Herbert Spencer. He's, his book, uh, which is called Political Institutions, discusses territory. And Herbert Spencer has become very popular in Japan um, and is translated into Japanese. And he uses, and the translator uses this term ryodo, using the characters for governed land to translate the words territory. And then Liang Chichao comes along a few years later, translating a different Japanese book. Um, and he copies the same Japanese uh, slash Chinese characters uh, pronounced ling to, but with the same literal meaning. And then a few years after that, the word becomes adopted by the revolutionary movement. So the word territory in the modern European Westphalian sense did not exist in Chinese language or therefore in Chinese thinking uh, until the 1890s, uh, 1900s. So the whole idea of territory as a fixed um, permanent boundary, that did not exist because the word had to be invented later on. And this process of inventing new words, new meanings happened in many areas of the nationalist movement. So the Chinese words for race, Zhongzhu, for national history, Guoxi, for nation itself, Minzu, territory, as I said, they were all invented, drawn up, coined um, in this same period by people like Liang Chichao, who you see in this picture here, the founder of modern, China, modern Chinese journalism, really. More than that, I'd say they probably the man who did more than many, more than most uh, to, uh, to invent, to construct, create the idea of, of modern China. So you can see in so many ways the word Minzu, for example, even now the meaning is unclear as to whether it means sort of ethnic group or, or nation. Does China have 56 different Minzu or one single Chinese Minzu, one single Zhonghua Minzu? So these questions which were brought into life in the 1900s are still alive. And I think this we need to actually think about what kind of society uh, the Qing state was in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. It was a fundamentally a, a divided society. It was a Manchu state. And you can see this here. So the map on the right is a map of Beijing. And you can see how the city has been divided in between a Tartar or Manchu city by these European map makers with the Chinese city outside it. And on the left, you can see the walls which separated the Manchu city from the Chinese city. So at this time, there was a clear distinction between the Manchu rulers of the country and the, uh, and, the, and the subject people. And I think we need to therefore to understand how this came about, because the Qing state was an inner Asian state. It was formed, obviously, in, in Manchuria, but people who at that time didn't call themselves Manchu. They chose that name later. They formed these military units called the Banners and then proclaimed what they initially called the later Jin dynasty. In 1635, they moved out of uh, Manchuria and conquered the Mongols next door, at which point the, uh, the leader of the Manchu uh, claimed also the title of Khan, as in Genghis Khan. He came to be the, uh, the, the successor, in effect, to, to, to Genghis Khan. Um, and then after he'd done that, then he proclaimed the Qing dynasty and then invades the, the Ming territories. So the Ming then become a subject people of the, the, the Ming territory area, becomes a subject area of the Qing dynasty, it becomes a colony. And the Qing dynasty expands, or the Qing state expands, in taking in uh, Tibet, or, you know, in a kind of semi-detached way in Xinjiang. And so you have a multi-ethnic state, a great state, to use uh, Timothy Brooks' term, in which a Mongol, sorry, in which a Manchu emperor and court rule uh, a multi-ethnic domain. Um, and then what we see in the 
uh, revolution is an attempt to sort of turn that inside out and to try and turn that multi-ethnic domain into a into a Chinese domain. And this has all, I think, been very well described in a whole slew of new books in the last 20 years. Um, and I think this has now become the orthodoxy among academics who look at this period of history, that this is, a, this is where the Chinese nationalist movement began in opposition to this um, uh, 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 sort of Manchu state, um, to, uh, first of all, to try and reform it and then, then to overthrow it. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of this sort of nationalist history that it's China, 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 all the way back, really fails to take account of the last 20 years of, um, of academic thinking on this subject. So, um, you know, we can talk about some other stuff uh, later on, but that, that, that's kind of, that's, that's sort of where I, where I come in. So back to you, Carl. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing. I mean, there, there's a, you brought in a lot of uh, dense information. Um, so to respond to some of the points you raised, which is quite interesting, um, I'm going to share my own slide, um, you know, which will help our audience. Um, so, uh, Sean, um, can I go ahead? Is there a question? OK, so I'm going to go share my own slides right now and uh, just give me a moment as I click present. Oh, present, no, present, not share, present. Um, my laptop is slowing down considerably. Oh, uh, wait, I closed, but wouldn't that, um, okay, okay, ah, I see, I see, okay, w what's going on here, I, I don't understand, let me just refresh my, yeah, let me just refresh. Um, oh, here we go. Sorry, okay, I'll reopen and I'll click present. Okay, so I, I first I wanted to talk about the idea of China. Um, the idea of China is really, it, it, it's a, it has been evolved over the years, right? And I remember, Bill, um, you you talk about uh, you didn't talk about it here in your presentation, but I remember uh, reading part of your book. I started re reading your book. I haven't finished it, but um, you talk about even the name of China was given by foreigners, right? So I, I just wanted to make it clear that um, China has you know the, the the people who lived in China have their own term for this. Uh, for China, which is Zongguo, right, which has been in use since 10th century BCE. So we're talking about 3000 years ago. And Zongguo literally meaning is central state. Now, back then, of course, the, the, the central state was not tied to a specific uh, ethnicity or territory. Um, it, it, was, it was tied more uh, uh, about cultural affinity uh, and to civilization, what we call the Chinese civilization, right? And the most of the dynasties ever since 2000, last, ever since 2000 years past have boasted being part of Zongguo, right, or China. And they will ha have their own dynastic names, the Han, the Tang, the Song, the Ming. But these titles are clearly interchangeable and they refer to the same polity, which is China. Um, and so by the by, by Ming Dynasty, China or Zongguo is already commonly used as state official title on edicts and other official documents. So now we get to the Qing, um, the Qing Empire, which you you spend quite a bit of time to talk about. Um, oh, well, one of the idea. Oh, how do I go back? Okay, one of the idea that you talk about is that. Uh, the, the, the territory, right? The, the, the idea of territory of China was was imported idea from from abroad, from from European Westphalian idea of territory. So what I wanted to point out, while it's true, the word Lintu um, is a term that was tra translated 
into Japanese and are co-opted by the Chinese intellectuals in late 19th century. You know, China clearly had an idea what territory is. They just used different names like Bantu, right? The, 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 the modern term Lintu, it, it maps to the, the, the Western feeling, uh, you know, nation state idea of territory. But, but you know, China, as it existed, um, you know, some you can even be or some even argue, you know, China either is as a universal empire or civilizational state or even proto nation state have existed for a long time. So this is a Song Dynasty map from 1100. Right. And uh, I need to remind my audience uh, that China clearly had a delineated, clearly delineated border way before the Europeans. There's a matter of that gray wall in the north, right? Stretching all across the entire length of China. You know, I, I think you can't get more sharply delineated border than that, right? This is a Song Dynasty map, which has shamelessly ripped off on a lecture by uh, Kenneth Pomerantz, um, a, a, a premier sonologist in the United States. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide. So. Um, Carl, are you saying, therefore, that the Great Wall is the official border of China? It was official border of China and, during and the Song now? Dynasty. And now? Now? Of course not. Of, of okay, course so not. the bits outside it were not part of the Chinese nation? No, no, that's not what I said. I said well, it does China, look like that, doesn't it? the idea of China is an evolving idea. It, you know, during, during different time period, you know, China, both the, 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 the concept and its territory expands or contracts. Depending so you agree with me that it's invented then, but it changes? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, right, that, okay, I'm pleased. Yes. So, so yes, in Song Dynasty, as you see, we have seen that Song Dynasty map, there's a clearly delineated border, right? And, and, and the Chinese themselves have mapped it. This is well, way, way before- Well, I would say that that, you know, that doesn't exist on the Southwest frontier. I'm sorry? It doesn't exist on the southwest frontier. Oh well, that's a different. Uh, that's a different. That's a different story, exactly. right? But, exactly. but, but it's not the same as saying there's no delineated border, right? So because you're saying that for the entire period that that wall was the border. No, no, no. For that time when the map was created, that mm -hmm. was a border at the time when the map was created and printed. I, the border always changes. I mean, like the border is not a fixed. We live in the modern world. We, you know, you, in the last 50 years, there have been a lot of borders, new nation created. So, so this is common. This is just normal, right? So let well, me let me. I'm not saying it's normal, but all I'm, all I'm saying is that that demonstrates the arbitrariness of these ideas about fixed boundaries and fixed nations. Uh, no, this is not not arbitrary. This is, uh, th I mean, the the, the 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 idea of sovereignty might be new, but um, but the border always existed, and, and it, it, it changes depending on on the power balance, right? The I word "chamu" does not mean the same thing as you know as territory. You know, the border, the frontier was a zone. Okay, <laughs> okay, Great Wall is. Pretty sharp, definely border. There isn't okay, one let, let, great let me, wall, Carl. You must know this. There isn't one great wall. There are many. There are many great wall built in different eras of China, different mm -hmm. dynasty, different mm -hmm. times. Like I said, the time the border will shift depending on the on the power balance, right? Just like the modern, even the modern borders change. Like the, the modern state of Southern Sudan was created what, like very recently, right? Yeah, invented, you might say. Yes, yes. I mean, the border change. I mean, I mean, borders between China and Vietnam was fixed in 2000. You know, there was there was negotiation going on. There was treaty. There was treaty between China and Russia in 1686 on fixing yeah. the border. Who but, negotiated that treaty? But then the, the you border know who was, negotiated that treaty. Uh, between the Qing Empire and the Russian Empire. Yeah. But let me, Do you know who it was? It was Jesuit Russia. missionaries. Catholic Jesuit missionaries from Europe negotiated the, that. Yes, Jesuit missionaries who are in the pay of the Kangxi Emperor of, of yeah. China. No, of, and no Chinese was spoken during those negotiations. It was all done in Manchu and Latin. That's fine, because yeah. no, I'm going to get to that. Is it a I'm Chinese border or is it a Manchu border? 
Well, Chi well, Manchu State, the Qin. Let can I go through my presentation? Uh, oh, yeah, then you cool. can poke, you can you know challenge my assertion because uh, I'm I'm my slide is a response to your book and to 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 the point your that you your slide is a response to an article in the Sydney Morning Herald, not my book. Actually, it does respond to to some of the points you raised. So give me give me a few minutes to respond. Let me get let me let me finish my my slide uh, presentation. Um, okay, so so you brought up uh, the Qin Empire, right? And 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 what you you said was actually what 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 you said was actually the. I'm sorry. What do you mean, Bill is blocking my view? Oh, 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 I see, I see, I see. Okay, 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 okay. Um, so I just click this close, right? Okay, okay. So, um, you know, what Bill has uh, cited is this so-called new Qin school of scholarship that emerged um, in the last 30 years or so. You know, it started with Pamela Crossley, et cetera. But even the new Qin history has been updated. Right, even you know, one of the one of the foremost scholar of New Qing history is Mark Elliott of Harvard, um, and he actually, the, the the new the latest research as a result of Western scholars being able to access you know records in China, both uh, both written in Chinese and Manchu. Now scholars offer a more complicated interpretation of the imperial Qing concept of China. So Mark Elliott has indicated. That because of unification of China proper and Inner Asia under the Qing, by the end of 1700, the meaning of China was no longer confined to China proper and the people living there. Right? That's Eliot from 2000, his book from 2000. And also Peter Perdue is another proponent of the Qing, uh, new Qing history. In his view, the rise of Chinese nationalism can be traced to the late 17th century when the Qin army encountered Russia during their North War expansion, right? Um, and such argument remind us the internal connection between Qin history and the 20th century Chinese national identity. I think that's what you are trying to present, Bill, is you are, you are trying to present this uh, uh, kind of the, the new forged Chinese nationalism uh, coming out of the late Qin. But we need to understand what is Qin, right? And the Qin empire initially started you know, as a Manchu state, they, you know, clearly defined themselves as different from that of Min. In fact, they call the Min dynasty the Nikan Gurum. Gurum is a uh, Manchu term for nation. Uh, Nikan is their, their name for Han. So they basically call Min a Han state, Nikan Gurum. But once, once the Qin Empire has conquered Min and all the rest of the territory, that concept start to shift and melt. And they, in fact, um, so an example of the Qin ruler's uh, flexibility uh, employing the Han concept of China is the Qianlong Emperor's 1755 pronouncement. He said, there exists a view of China, Zhongxia. This is a, Zhongxia is a Chinese yeah. term. So that's a different name for China then? It is, but like, let me finish. So there are different names for China, right? There's there for longest time um, back in the Zhou Dynasty, the, the the common term is Huaxia, right? The Xia is um, you know Huaxia is interchangeable. The people refer them as Hua, and they refer the Chinese um, states who adopted the Chinese civilization as Xia. You know, in, in even as far as uh, as uh, warring states period, right? Um, we're talk we're talking about twenty five hundred years ago. Um, there's a concept of Zhu Sha, or many Sha, as like many states of Sha. Even though at the time after the Zhou Dynasty broke up into many statelets, a lot of these statelets still agree they're part of this Chinese nation. They they uh, there's a concept. Of we are of the same civilization, right? And that that shot. Then of course uh, you talk about the Han, right? Creating of the Han race, etc. I know that's a big point of your your book. Um, Han, of course, didn't exist as a as a name for Chinese civilization after the Han Dynasty was established, right? And and the Han Dynasty, of course, you know. But before that, the the name for China was. Huaxia. It just it just 
it's interchangeable, right, with with the other ten names for China. So in Qianlong Emperor's pronouncement in 1755, he says there exists a view of China, Zhongxia, according to which non-Han people cannot become China's subject and their land cannot be integrated into the territory of China. This does not represent our dynasty's understanding of China, but it's instead that of the earlier Han, Tang, Song, and Ming dynasties, right? So what Manchu, what the Qin Empire has done is they created the idea of China as a multi-ethnic state, as a multi-ethnic empire. And this influenced <coughs> the thinking of the later Han intellectuals. And in fact, the Manchu called their own state after they founded the Qin dynasty. They call it the Dunlin Bai Gurum, which is a transcription of the Chinese name for China, which is Zongguo, which I mentioned earlier means central state. So, so Gurum, again, it's a, uh, oops, uh, Guru is a Manchu term for nation, and Du Limbai is uh, means central, so central central state, just like what Zongguo means in Chinese. So, so Manchu adopted this term to call their own state of Qin Empire, and then uh, <clears throat> we have, uh, and you also mentioned that the idea of China. Um, you know, the, the Chinese nationalism and, or, or the incorporating the different territory of Qin Empire as China didn't come into being until late 19th century. So I am again, I ripped a, a slide from a um, lecture from Kenneth Pomerant. Um, uh, this is a this is an article published by a Han literati official in 1827. He wrote in 1820. And he says, the country of the great Qin is that which has been called Zhongguo since the time of the mythical ancient sage King Yao. Now he's explicitly equating the Qin empire to that of China, to Zhongguo, to the name Zhongguo, right? And the territory it occupies in the east and south is bordered by the sea. In the north and west, it does not reach the sea, but written agreements can be cited as there's no sea given its shape to the north and the west. Today, its farthest boundary in the west reaches to Ai Wu Gan and stops there. In the north, it, uh, its farthest border reaches a government post at Wu Liang Hai and stops there. And Wu Liang Hai refers to, you know, Wu Liang Hai uh, or, or Tanu Tuva. It's today's, uh, you know, the, the, the Tuvan Republic in the Russian Federation. So the treaty he refers uh, the written agreement he referred to, obviously, is a treaty signed between Qin and the Russian Empire, both in the uh, 1686 and the 1700s, de delineated the border between the two. And now, uh, again, um, the Qin rulers themselves identify with China. They expand their scope to include various parts of Inner Asia and refer to a multi-ethnic entity. In the final years of Qin dynasty, this inter imperial interpretation was actually embraced by Han literati and officially disseminated, uh, disseminated through an educational system. It reaches a wide audience and strongly influenced the Han Chinese perception of their own state, right? So, so this, this is how the, the, the Qin state actually modified the Han Chinese uh, concept of what China is by reinforcing the idea that China is a multinational uh, state, and 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 uh, this is a map. Also, this is a map of the Qin Empire from the eighteen forties. Who, who drew Zhang this map? Da who drew this map? This is a Zhang, it's an Englishman, Zhang Zhang Dower. Right? Yeah, so and, therefore, it's it's uh, representing an authentic depiction, is it? Well, we it gives an idea, right, of China. I mean, the, the, the exact it gives, boundary. It gives a British man's idea. This he this is not an idea. He came from his head, right? So the northern border of China. Yeah, it seems Empire, to be removing a lot of complexity from this whole story by assuming that this map here somehow represents a truth. Wait, wait, wait! Hold on. Let me finish. So Let you me see. Finish. Japan is think. colored in in the same colors as uh, as China. So does that mean Japan belongs to China? No, no, no. But but this is a map of of China and Japan. Obviously, you know, J Japan is in a different color, right? And, and so this is Taiwan. Is a, so is Hainan. 
So are the Philippines. You see, the Philippines and Taiwan are the, are the same color. Okay. So does that okay. mean? So, that, so, so hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me let me finish my presentation because I I did not I let you allow you the time give you as a yeah. courtesy to, to let you finish right. So this is a map that presented by Zhang Dower um, in in the 1840s. This is a this is a map of of China and and it has it shows a border the the northern border of the Qin Empire was defined. Um, in this section, by the Treaty of Narchinsky, uh, Narchinsk in 1686, and then in, in the 1700s, uh, another treaty fixed the border between the the Mongolia under Qin Empire and the Russian Empire, and and the, the these these are the considered the traditional boundaries of China. That means I mean there are specific uh, lines that may have have not been clearly delineated. Another another point about boundaries that, that you, you you said. So so the Qin uh, okay, so let me I'm, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. But Qin Empire actually also clearly delineated their border with Korea. This this happened under the Kangxi Emperor's reign. You know, they they specified that that the border between China and Korea should run along the Yalu River. So that's that's another idea that you know, the Qin that didn't have a concept of clean, cleanly delineated border is clearly false. Um, and and, and the, the, the point you raise about Qin is a, is a colonial uh, a state, or, you know, a foreign state controlling China. Therefore, you know, you cannot equate Qin empire with China. I will bring you something you are more familiar with. This is the Battle of Hastings, right? And we all know what happened. The, uh, the, the, French, the Norman French, came and conquered England. And the consequence of that is, you know, when we have the Anglo-Saxon pig, when it was consumed, is uh, it becomes the French pork, right? So, so we have a clearly, clearly differentiating, uh, differentiation here between an Anglo-Saxon subject class and yeah. military conquering elite. Yeah, right? exactly. A good analogy. So, 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 so what are you saying is that England did England cease to become England after Battle of Hastings? I mean, you can no longer equate, um, you know, whatever our country, happened our to country after, isn't called England. Well, uh, whatever happened to um, our country you know, is called like, the United Kingdom. England sure, is sure, but, one part but, of but, it. But it can you, are you denying the continuity from um, uh, uh, from you know like that? We, for as far as people from other countries are concerned, right? This is the country is still the same. You just now you just have a. Oh, hang on, hang on. haven't you heard of Northern Ireland? Haven't you heard of Scottish independence movements? Yes, yes, yes. But but I'm asking you right now, right? Uh, we're not talking even talking about Scottish at this point. I mean, let's just focus on England, right? Does England cease to be England? Does England cease to be England after it part of a Norman state, which also includes parts of northern France? Sure, sure, but but is is it England a colony today, of a northern, It becomes a colony you, of a Norman state. Yes, is England today not England? Any can we like deny that England today is no longer England? There is no English state. England is a That's, cultural concept. Exactly. Okay. Perfect. So, so you are you are hang up on this idea of ethno state, right? But the the fact is, China is not a Han ethno state. Never claimed to be. You know, this 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 was not this was not proclaimed either in uh, under Qing Empire or uh, the People's Republic of China, right? People's Republic of China said very specifically, explicitly, in fact. That it, it is a multi-ethnic state, right? Much like the Qin Empire proclaimed yeah, under, the, under the influence of Stalin. Well, yeah. I there's Soviet influence, of course, but there's also a long tradition, you know, dating from the Qin Empire. In fact, uh, Mr. Xiang Yu, can you play a clip um, for me uh, from the the lecture of um, from the lecture of um, uh, of a uh, of a uh, Kenneth Pomeranth um, on this subject, how China become big. It's a very short clip. Uh, just for, start from the first section. Yeah. Chinese states did draw sharply defined borders when they needed to. 
Certainly the Qing did so when dividing sparsely populated areas with Russia in its treaties in 1689 and 1727. In these negotiations, moreover, the Qing quickly dropped the pretense that the Son of Heaven occupied a fundamentally different, superior plane from that of the Tsar, and they negotiated as state to state with an understanding of equality. Chinese state did draw sharply defined borders when they need to. Certainly the Qing did when dividing sparsely populated areas with Russia in treaties in 1689 and 1727. In this negotiation, moreover, the Qing quickly drops the pretense that some of heaven occupy a fundamentally different superior plane than Adam Tsar. They negotiated a state to state with understanding of the equality. So this is talking about the Qing Empire's understanding of the Western West Philian um, nation state idea of equality and sovereignty, and also talking about sharply delineated border. Now, there's a different um, section. Um, uh, wh wh where does this start, uh, Mr. Xiangyu? It starts at 1549. Um, how about this? If I send you guys the Twitch link and you guys go on Twitch, you guys can see it. I mean, my point here is, as I mentioned, is that that Treaty of Nuchinsk was negotiated by Catholic Jesuit minister, um, missionaries. Yeah, they were the ones who were like a kind of a, a, gear, a clutch, a gearbox, trying to yeah. intermediate between a Qing view of the world and a Russian view of the world in order to prevent conflict. So actually, Jeez. the Treaty of Nuchinsk was kept secret. There was no Chinese version published until about 200 years later when the British um, found themselves in conflict with the Russian Empire. It's not a secret because it's published in Manchu, in Mongolian, in Latin, in Russian. These, these are all, the, the yeah, documents are Chinese. written down. Not Chinese and not distributed through the through the empire. Well, well it's not distributed. It's not in Chinese because there's no Chinese living in that area. There's no Han Chinese living well, in that area. How can you claim it as being a delineated Chinese border? It's a delineated border of the Qin Empire and the Qin ruler themselves call the it China. The Manchu, the Manchu ruled uh, Qin Empire, yeah. Yes, the, the Manchu ruled the Qin Empire and the Qin Empire is staffed by Han Chinese literati officials. And no, well, the, 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 at, in, at different levels and within the former Ming domain. Obviously, they didn't really run Tibet or Xinjiang or Manchuria or Mongolia. Oh, OK. So let me let me read. Yeah, that's why. Let me go and they back. Didn't, and, and, they, and they certainly didn't rule the uplands along the southwest frontier because they were left to local tribes and indigenous people to manage. So there was that, no front. That was, that was initially in the early day of Qin, between the 1700s. Yeah. And all starting the way, from all the way up until the 1900s, the southwestern border was fluid and unknown. Starting from 1720, the, the Han literatis of the Qin Mandarin class started advocating, you know, imposing direct rule in the southwest China. In fact, that it led to many rebellions in the yeah. area until 1880s. So, yeah, so 1820s. So, shows so how is, fluid and uh, vague the frontiers were. Sure, but the, there's nobody, nobody that could claim that part as their territory. The, you know, only only China as a, as a polity is is claim, is putting their foot down and claiming as as its own. Well, you have, there's, you there's have no conflicting autonomous. There's no conflicting claims. There's no conflicting claims. And, and um, also uh, autonomous who were then squashed and incorporated into the Chinese state. It's it's been continually squashed in under the Qing Empire. The Qing, oh, yeah, Qing the Empire. Qing was, the Qing was a colonial state. You're right. So, so OK, so so is so so is Norman French. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, so so is. Uh, and you know, I, I, committed there's genocide. No, there's no, the I'm not denying Qin is a conquering military uh, elite aristocracy, just like the Norman French that did to England. I yeah. mean, but but in the after 300 years, guess what? You know, they just became 
they they just become you know part of the ruling class and and, and no, that no, part that's of the process that I describe in my book, the invention of China. It didn't just happen; it happened through twenty years of argument, discussion, and invention. But you, your your main point was this was um, you know this was initiated by the Western influence, and I I you you yes. give very little yes. agency. To the Chinese themselves. No, this, you haven't this read the book. I am oh. arguing that you the Chinese have been doing this, the process of state forming and state formation, way before there's any inf European influence. Oh, you seem to have imagined a version of my book, and you're arguing against something that doesn't exist. No, I, I mean, I listened to your presentation. I didn't interrupt you. I listened to your presentation. I let I let you allow you to say what you have to say, and then I'm responding to that right now. Okay, um, what I'm saying is that in this 20-year period between 1890 and 1910, the whole idea of China was reconstructed. You, yes, your that is your point. My point is it dates way before that. It dates way before 18, 1890s. That this 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 process started back in the 17th century when when the Qin Hou the Qin domain the Qin domain started to be transformed. You know, from a Manchu-dominated empire to transform the, the understanding of Qin Empire being transformed into that of China. That that is no, what it didn't happen. Slide. It didn't happen. You, you, you can't you can't say it didn't happen just because you you don't believe it. I give you evidence. No. I give you evidence of Han literatis writing in 1820s about how Xinjiang should be governed, about how Xin, they should send in, uh, 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 send in immigrants into Xinjiang and to in, in, in institute direct rule, and, and how they view Xinjiang is part of, of Zhongguo. And, 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 and um, Mr. Mr. Xiangyu, can you actually give me a second, Bill? Mr. Xiangyu, Okay, uh, what was your suggestion to play the clip to to both my audience and me and Bill so, so he um, can respond? I can't share my screen with you guys directly because I'm doing it through um, uh, OBS. But what you can do is when I do play the video clip is for you to go on the actual Twitch stream. And I've sent the link to the Skype chat. So if you just copy and paste uh, it. Okay, hold on one second. Let me let me open the conversation. <laughs> Is that we're looking at you? You've quoted me two books which are more than twenty years old now, and the world has moved on. Oh yes, I'm citing a lecture from 2018, Bill. Don't worry, I'm citing a lecture from 2018. So 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 relax. Okay, hold on. I'm uh. Carl and Bill, do you guys have this Twitch stream open? Just keep it I muted for now. Twitch, I have the Twitch link. Uh, I'm okay. So that's what I am seeing live, right? So uh, okay, great. And, uh, Mr. Hayton, okay. do you have it open? Uh, yeah. Have a look. Okay. Um, so, so Xiangyu, can you play the second, second segment? Through much of imperial history, maps often showed fairly clear borders in the north, but rarely in the south. So here are two quick examples. This is one from the Song Dynasty, and you can see that in the north, you have a fairly sharp boundary delineated. And in the south, it just kind of gradually bleeds out. Um, this is a slightly later map, not one made by a state entity, but by a Buddhist monastery. But you see the same phenomenon. One of the best established truisms about traditional Chinese notions of ethnicity and nationality is that they were culturalist rather than biological or racial. In other words, somebody who followed Chinese ways of living could be considered Chinese regardless of skin color or eye folds. This viewpoint echoes through the classics with stories of ancient sage kings from barbarian lands, etc. And it fits perfectly with thinking that frontier peoples could be transformed and made indistinguishable from those of the central plain. Many Han officials and intellectuals recommended withdrawing from most of the newly conquered buffer zone. 
abundant precedent suggested that trying to garrison this area, much less rule it directly, would simply be too expensive. And when the Qing emperor solicited suggestions on how to handle the frontier, he was rather surprised to get a lot of people writing in and saying, OK, we won. Now let's get out. We've taught these people a lesson, but we don't want to be there. But interestingly, after some serious unrest in Xinjiang in the 1820s had been suppressed, statecraft-oriented Han Chinese intellectuals, who had become in the intervening decades far more involved in studying and sometimes governing frontier regions than they had been at first, uniformly rejected retreat. On the contrary, several of them, most prominently a man named Gung Zhejian, in an essay published in 1827 that we'll get back to in a couple minutes, argued that Xinjiang needed a larger permanent garrison. And this in turn, he said, required bypassing the region's non-Han indigenous elites, instituting direct rule down to the local level, encouraging immigration, and relying on economic expansion fueled by those immigrants to generate the needed revenue. In other words, what he was advocating was the exact opposite of the old idea that you wanted to engage with the frontier as much as you needed to for security, but not much more because it was basically a hopeless morass and particularly a hopeless place in which to try to live a Han style quote, civilized life. Now the Qing were far too weak at this point to thoroughly implement the aggressive policy that Gung called for, but they did begin promoting immigration to the Northwest after 1831, a sharp turnaround from previous policy. And perhaps as important as the actual policy changes is that Han Chinese support for a much stronger presence in Xinjiang even if it came at a high cost, showed that they now saw this area as at least a potential part of civilization, not to be abandoned. Reinforcing this, the Qing also began changing place names in Xinjiang during the 1830s, substituting names recalling past Chinese outposts for the names that had been in place before that which were transliterations into Chinese of names in local languages. So they were essentially trying to make this place look familiar and look as if it was Chinese, something they had not tried to do before. Now, many influences lay behind this reversal. For one, these Han intellectuals appeared to be following a linguistic shift that had begun in Qing state documents that of explicitly equating the dynasty's entire territory with Zhongguo, that term literally meaning central country, or as in Western somewhat orientalizing translations, middle kingdom, is the term that today is translated simply as China. Gong Zhejun, for instance, began the essay on Xinjiang that I mentioned in a striking, though somewhat illogical fashion. He begins by saying, there are many countries under heaven, but none is as large as our great Qing. A formulation that certainly sounds much more like a modern notion of inherently plural territorial states than any notion of even potentially universal empire. And he then continues, the country of the great Qing is that which has been called Zhongguo since the time of the mythical ancient sage king Yao. The territory it occupies in the east and south is bordered by the sea. In the north and west, it does not reach the sea, but written agreements can be cited, as there are no seas giving, shape, giving its shape to the north and west. Today, its farthest boundaries in the west reach to Aiwugan and stop there. In the north, its farthest border reaches to the government post at Wuliang Hai and stops there. Now the written agreements in question are clearly the 1689 and 1727 treaties with Russia. 
And Gong refers soon after this passage to the Qing having expanded beyond the territory held by other dynasties. So he is obviously aware that this had not been Chinese territory ever since ancient times. In nonetheless equating all of Qing territory to the setting of China's classical past, he essentially sacralized his own era's borderlands, making them something that any literatus, as an inheritor and transmitter of ancient culture, should want to keep within China. Gong's move resembles many other creations of deep national pasts by modern nationalists, often in fact at roughly this time in the 19th century, despite the absence of any trace of Western influence on him. Are we done? Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so that, um, Bill, is uh, my cited reference to your claim that you know, the, the, it's a totally Western idea of concept of territory. Um, and also, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea of China, mapping the idea of China to the whole of Qin Empire was a late uh, 19th century invention. So, so the reason yeah, I, I cited... Uh, you know, go ahead. We're just using... English, we're speaking English here, aren't we? So what word was actually used? Well, if you if I'm using Chinese term, you'll be Zongguo, right? Okay. But, and and did, did they use Zongguo there, or did they have a different term? Oh yes. Um, so this was actually a, a, a Han literati, right? Writing uh, about <laughs> Qin Empire, I mean, yeah, and he. That, the, my issue with this is, used, is you seem to think that when somebody says something, or when somebody draws a map, that that's the truth. That that's reality, as opposed to somebody's idea of what they would like the world to be. So when well, somebody actually, does a map with a line actually, around it, it doesn't we are actually talking mean about ideas, aren't we? We're, your your whole book yeah. is talking about invention of China. You are talking yeah. about ideas. We are yeah. discussing ideas. I'm yeah. telling you, this is a in, this is a Chinese idea of China throughout history, it's from not. you know back two thousand years ago all the way to today, and it's it's a, it's an evolving so idea. Far, you've to, so far you've told me that borders have moved, identities have moved, that frontiers were not fixed, and that maps can be colored in different colors and may not mean the things that they say, okay? It's invention. That's what the book's about. I'm, talk I'm addressing specific points you raise in your book. You know, no, you, ha you haven't read my book, so how do you know what my book says? Okay, so let me, let me, <laughs> I read enough your review of your book and your no, talks. So you you read an your article talks, by somebody your, else the talks about you're my book. about your books. Which, you know, which I sat through three hours where you talk about invention of Han race uh, yep. and invention of China, right? Yep. Your, your, your last two talks. I sat through that. I listened right. to your ideas. And it's very similar to the idea you just presented here. So that's what I'm responding to, Bill. But not the book, just to be clear. I, I do have your book. I'm starting to read on it, but I, I'm afraid if I... You know, there, there will just be more holes I will try to poke through. But I, from based on what you just presented so far, right, I'm responding to that. I'm responding to the fact that, you know, the, the, the Chai Chinese didn't have a clear concept of territory. They didn't have a clearly yeah. delineated border before, before the rival Europeans. So I, I just, I, before, you know, before yeah. the you European ac you, ac you accept that there was no, when, if I show you a map published in 1936, an atlas with a preface that says, we had no idea where the borders were in China. Okay, let, let me respond to what, that specific what, what does point. That, what does that tell you? Let me, like, I will tell you exactly. The idea of Republic of China as a unitary uh, state with central government was a fiction, right? Because mm -hmm. Republic of China, right, it, it, the, the, the central government of Republic of China had very little control of its mm -hmm. outlying territories. The, the whole of China after the collapse of the Qin Empire was ruled by local warlords, potentates. You know, the, 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 the central government of China in 1936, uh, you know, under Chiang Kai-shek, only consisted the area around the Yangtze Delta River region, right? But I will address to you the point why Taiwan was not 
included in the in the part of China, but whereas Xinjiang, Mongolia, and Tibet was because China respects international treaties, and because China was defeated in the first Sino-Japanese War of 1894 and 1995, it ceded the island of Taiwan to the Empire of Japan. So in 1936, Taiwan was still a Japanese colony. Yep. Right. Even though it's on equal treaty imposed on China, but China still respected. So there was the no treaty, claim. Treaty, it's respected its treaty obligations. That's why it did not re regard Taiwan as part of its territory. On the other hand, there's no other country in the world at the time recognized either Mongolia or, or, or Tibet or Xinjiang as independent territories. You know, that they, the, the reason why so Mongolia you, have to have to held a referendum in 1946 is to declare formal independence from Republic of China. Because that, under international and law, that was accepted. under and that was international accepted. law, Mongolia, Tibet was still part of China. If you look at the maps accepted. published by United States, about published by Britain, it shows Mongolia and Tibet as part of Republic of China at the time. Now, the Republic of China, you are, you are right. Republic of China has very little control over those parts in reality. They have, they have no boots on the ground. They also have very little knowledge of their border regions because Republic of China was a yeah. very poor, weakly organized government. It has, it has very little resources. The, the, the reason why they have to translate Western maps and slap Chinese name on it, because in 1936, this is a time, this China right on the eve of Japanese invasion, right? And the Republic of China was very- The reason they did it was because they had no idea. They were inventing it. They were making it up. They had no, they had no idea because they have very little resources yes, to exactly. Map they out had no history. idea about the South China Sea. That's they a, had never surveyed the southwestern frontier. The, the, the they China, didn't know. They did not know in Nanjing because they did not. Right. You know, they like I said, they have very little control over the territory that was, yes, you know, officially nominal under Republic of China. But no country in the world disputed the ownership of Tibet, of Mongolia, of Xinjiang, at least a nominal ownership. No country in the world. Find the Mon I think you'll find the Mongolian princes disputed the ownership of Mongolia. They disputed, but there's, you know, there's something to be and said the Republic, about the international and the people's Republic There's crushed. something to be said about the Westphalian system, right? The Westphalian nation. Nation state system that was created by the West, which is a system that China well, which abided nation by. Existed in Mongolia. Which nation existed in Mongolia? Qin Empire. Ha, ha, which nation? Mongolia. Which nation existed in Mongolia? A nation exactly. is a group of people. Which nation existed in Mongolia? Carl, he's talking about Ming Minzu. Oh, ethnicity. He's talking about ethnicity. Yes, the Mongols. Of course, Mongols yeah. inhabit so a Mongolia. Mongol nation, not a Chinese nation. Like I said, Chinese, China, China is a multi-ethnic state, just like the Qin Empire is a multi-ethnic state, proclaimed by the Qin emperors themselves. And, and the, the, the in sub, uh, subsequent government after the Qin, right, the Qin emperor abdicated to the government of Republic of China. The Republican, Republic of China and also the People's Republic of China both proclaimed themselves to be multi-ethnic states. Right, so well, that is just not just including the Han Chinese, you know, it includes the Mongols, the Tibetans, you know, all, all the all the ethnicity of China. Of China has never been declared as an ethno Han ethno state. I think you you are, you I think you are you're conflating several things. That you are conflating the idea of a very few radical revolutionaries in the late 19th century, uh, I Empire. would say that the idea of a homogenous single Zhonghua Minzu was there from the beginning in the writings of Liang Qichao and Sun Yat-sen. They were both racists. I, I, both I, okay, so, so there's no doubt. To, they both wanted to There's no to doubt extinguish. that Sun Yat-sen is a Han nationalist. There's no doubt that, that Liang Qichao uh, has some very bad ideas which he got from the social Western social Darwinist writers. But I would tell yeah, you- and those ideas the are the foundation you, of modern some China. Some of the writers you cited in your book, you know, um, Huang, uh, Huang Zunxian, 
Yang Fu, right? Most of these people, if you ask average people in China on the street, they will have no idea who these yeah. people are. And most people right? in Britain they won't know who Yang Fu is. They, they have a very limited influence, a limited window. The most influenced person is Liang Qicao, right? But even Liang Qicao, his writing, his problematic writing on race, uh, very people know about that nowadays in China. You know, I did not know Yang Qicao wrote those things until I came to the United States. What Yang Qicao is known in China is for his idea on Chinese nationalism and how yeah. and his idea on reforming China. These people provided the foundation upon which everything else was then built. Yes, but Liang Qicao is only one of the influenced writers. Like I said, his most influence on the today's Chinese discourse is not his idea on race. You know, that, that thing I was not even aware of when I was growing well, up. Are. He invented the word Minzu. So therefore, okay. everything depends on that word. Okay, so mean, what, what, what does Minzu mean to you? Let me ask you that. Maybe, maybe you have a misunderstanding what that means. Minzu, this is the problem. It has two different meanings, depending on who you ask. So, and this is the other problem is that you're trying to translate European ideas of race and nation and ethnic group, which are themselves nonsense. There's no such thing as race. Yeah. Do you accept that? Or do you think there are biological differences? Sure, between sure. There's, it's a social right. construct. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Go okay. So Minzu in China now says there are 56 Minzu. Yeah. 56 different mm -hmm. national minorities. But it also says there's one China Minzu, a Zhonghua Minzu. So what is Minzu? Yeah, what's the difference? It's a very flexible term that you can include whatever you want. Yeah. So there's right now, currently, currently the term Zhonghua Minzu have evolved to include all ethnicity, all the people. When you say it's China. evolved, what you mean is there's been an ideological change imposed from the top. Because Zhonghua Minzu used to be the language of the Republic and the nationalists and the communists wouldn't use it. They would talk about Zhonghua Renmin as a completely different political formulation. But now, as the People's Republic has moved to a more nationalist construction, it starts to use Zhonghua Minzu and less, well, and, and both at the same time, Zhonghua Renmin, China people, and Chinese nation. It uses the yes. same. Yes, but now they're interchangeable. I mean, the, the, so when you use the mm. term Zhonghua Minzu in Chinese context, now it's understood it's inclusive, includes everyone. I and mean, there, there was a point. Another level of invention, Carl. This is what I'm talking about, another level of invention. Okay, I mean, I, I, I have no problem with that. I mean, right. the, so Zhonghua you accept Minzu the premise of the book, then. just like the, chi the, ch the meaning of China itself evolved, evolved, but it doesn't mean it didn't exist, right? It, it didn't mean China yeah. didn't exist Look, until like 1850. No, it doesn't no, mean the Han people didn't exist until 1850. There was no There's state a, called Zhonghua or Zhongguo until 1912. I just, I just, ref I just told you that. Uh, the various dynasties, they will refer themselves by the dynastic names. But at the time, the same time, they refer to the polity as Zhongguo, as an interchangeable no. name. There was, Zhongguo is referred to a place, right? No, uh, oh, it's a place, it's an idea, it's a metaphor, it's a spiritual reference, it's a political system, it's many sure. things. Sure. Yeah? So it's only but, when Liang Qichao comes along and says this thing is called Zhong, Zhongguo going back into ancient history. He invents the idea that this has been a continuous name for a state going back into history. He's the one who invents it. Uh, and you're the spiritual except descendants the name of Liang Qichao. has been used since the Tang yes. Dynasty. Yes. Zhongguo has. has been used but since not the as the name of a state. It's a description. It means the central we have state. We have official state documents referring to the polity as Zhongguo, dating back to, to Tang Dynasty. No, you don't. You have, state, you have documents referring to a geographical area, to a political relationship between the center and the periphery, to a reference to a piece of territory. I mean, go and read Richard Smith if you want to, you know, if you want to kind of another source on this, you know. What you have is a nationalist. You know what you're sprouting right now. It's the same line that Japanese imperialists sprouted yeah, since, well, uh, since the Sino-Japanese War in 1895. Well, the because the Japanese argue nationalist imagination. Because it's the Japanese argue that China cannot use the term Zhongguo, right? Because the, 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 that's why the Japan insisted instead of calling China Zhongguo, the, the term that Chinese themselves uses, the Japanese use the term Shina. 
right? And 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 and, and because As they did they had Sun for a while. What's that? As did Sun Yat Sen for a while when he was based in Japan. He also adopted that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Sun Yat Sen has plenty of problematic ideas. I mean, there, there's no doubt about that. But even Sun Yat Sen quickly back paddled. And, and, and retracted his idea of Han nationalism after the Qin Empire was overthrown because then the re he realized, oh, wait a minute, maybe we're not ready to give up on all these outer lying territories that, that that's, uh, that's inhabited by national minorities. So, so the, 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 the constitution of Republic of China, you know, they talk about Wu Zhu Gong He, right? The Republic of five nationalities, you know. Of, oh, hang on, hang on, that's, there you go. There you go, there's your problem. Translate Wu Zhu Gong He again. Translate. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a Republic. What does Zhu mean? Could I interject? Yes, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead, Xiang Yu. So, um, I think we know that when it comes to defining Minzu or nations, um, the P the PRC did take a lot of inspiration from um, Comrade Stalin's um, work, Marxism and the National Question. So, I'm just going to do a quote real quick. Um, what is a nation? A nation is primarily a community, a definite community of people. This community is not racial, nor is it tribal. Blah blah blah. It's um basically what he's saying is, it's um a stable community with a common land, a common language, common economic activity, and all of that. And it could be argued that when the PRC was founded, the 56 different nations within China were not as interconnected as they are today. Um, so, yes, there are still 56 officially recognized nations, but there's also um, they also fit into a um, broader definition of nation, which is they have a common language, they have a common economic activity, they have... They have common culture. They have common. They have shared culture. They have shared territory. They have shared national experience. So yeah, yeah. I my my translation of Minzu because uh, Bill asked me that question is ethnicity. I mean, the you know there are fifty six different ethnicity within China. You know, Han is just one of the you know more majority mo most numerous ethnicity. Right. And, 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 you know, China is a multi ethnic state uh, is very specifically says so. <laughs> he never claimed to be a Han ethno state. Right. That there's no entity that claimed, you know, China to be a Han ethno state. You know, not, not that I'm aware of. No, because but there was a very real argument in 1911, 1912 about whether that should be the case, wasn't there? But they lost out, didn't they? They lost out very quick. Yeah. The, <clears throat> because they were forced to by Yuan Shikai and the remnants of the, the Qing army. Yes, but they lost. That's my point. The, the yeah. people who propose the idea of a Han ethno state, a very small group of very radical revolutionaries, never represented the huge majority of the Chinese people. And, and they were only, they only gained prominence in a very fractional period of time and they never really gain power so so there you go i mean you you are blowing up a, a small you know you, you are blowing up this a very like a very small time window in china in late Qing, when there's a lot of intellectual fervent when, when there's a lot of like imported western ideas especially problematic ideas you, as you mentioned about race and and um, a nation and 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 these people but these people lost out. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I don't know. No, I don't know what kind of point you're didn't. trying to make about they, the modern they, China. These, because these people think, laid the foundations for now. What's happening in Xinjiang now? The need to impose a homogenous identity goes back to Liang Qiao and Sun Yat-sen. Yeah, the the idea of the single Chinese nation, getting rid of difference. Okay, that's the foundation for it. So you you but you were talking about the the the, the Wu Zhu Gong here, yeah. So how would you translate that literally? Uh, so it's a it's a a, a republic it? shared by the five ethnicities. Well, Zhu. What does Zhu mean? Ethnicity. No, it doesn't. Yeah, of it course it does. It means lineage. It's a family lineage. That's the original meaning of it. You see how the word's meaning has changed. Of course, but in in terms of Wu Zhu Gong He, it does not mean lineage. In well, terms of Wu Zhu Gong He, it's talking about that's ethnicity. Because the meaning but yes, of originally the Zhu is yes. is talking about lineage. Originally, another, but, another but 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 then now you have talk about the introduction of the term Minzu, right, from Japan. You know, which which refers to eth ethno nationality, ethnicity. You know, very kind of mixed 
nebulous term, right? And and that term, yes, that term was introduced. But in terms of Wuzhu Gonghe, specifically, we're talking about ethnicity. The five ethnicity, yep. Mongo, Mong, it was it was a uh, Mongo, Tibetan, Han, Muslim, and uh, what's the other one? What's Manchu. the other one? The oh yeah, the Manchu. Manchu. Yes, Manchu. Yeah, Manchu. Yeah. Okay. So they, there's a classic case. There's a word that changed its meaning. Zhu became from lineage, became ethnicity. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so I, I believe you're trying to make a point about modern China. I mean, I'm trying to make a point specifically about the, the modern state of PRC, right? And I mean, like all your books, I, I see a, like a pattern. Like there's something you want to say about the present state of PRC. Can you make that, that statement, Bill? Well, what I want to say is, you know, I think some, another review is coming out shortly, which basically says that we should treat China as a normal state. We should see China as a, st as a nation state, just like all the others that invented aspects of its past, played down other aspects of it to for political reasons, in order to, to control territory, in order to control its domestic population and so forth. And so it invented a whole load of national myths in order to do that. And so that's what we see. So just like Germany, just like Korea, just like Britain, just like Italy, China, Japan, you know, all gone through the same process. So every one of them is special. Every one of them is different, but they all go through the same things. And so the idea of using history to justify territorial claims and so forth, all states do it. All states make stuff up. And as I showed at the beginning, all you have to do is look at the evidence and you can unravel it. Okay, I mean, I actually do not disagree from that. I mean, is there somebody making a point that China should be treated differently, like not as a, as a normal nation state? Did, 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 is somebody making that argument? Yeah, well, well, all those people who talk about China's not a state, it's a civilization and all that kind of stuff. Isn't that what you're trying to, isn't that what you said in your book, that China was the kind of civilizational idea until no. 19th century when the nation state idea of coalesced? And, 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 I think and, we, uh... need, we need to get into the idea of what a, what a great state was. Tim Brooks' idea on a dark wall, that dark wall is just a, is an inner Asian form of empire. That's what the, the Mongol dynasty was. That's what the Ming kind of tried to be. And it's definitely what the Qing were. Well, China had been a universal empire since time well, memorial. <laughs> well, again, this, is a, this is a nice bit of nationalist myth-making, yes. Wait, wait, I mean, I, no, I mean, this is, China has been a, a, a universal empire according to its classics, according to all the, all the official... I mean, I mean I'm, not, I'm not saying whether it is or, or it's in mm -hmm. act, but, but in the ideas presented in the Confucian classic, China is a universal empire so with the idea few, of, of, of emperor rules all under heaven, right? With emperor cent center in the middle, his power radiates out. and there, But there's also clearly a uh, boundary between like what's considered civilized and the barbarian, right? And, and, and what, what, what's to be ruled and what's just, like not wor worthless to be ruled. I mean, but, but, but the idea of chi China as a universal empire is, uh, is a longstanding one. It's, it's well, I think in what you're doing. The Chinese text is you're mixing up ideas of civilization, political legitimacy, and culture with a particular state formation, and the idea that somehow this applied equally across the whole territory. Yes, clearly, the literati, the elite, had an idea about what a state was and how it should rule. Yeah, but your peasant in the field had absolutely no idea about this was going on. Yeah, people who lived in the uplands were not part of this. Uh, this applied to a certain number of people in the lowlands or in cities, uh, people who were literate. It was not a nation in that sense. What happens in the late 19th century is this vision becomes projected back in the past and extended across territory to say this has been like this always. And, all, you know, and this is our civilization becoming a state. And to some extent, you're the intellectual heir of that. You're following that, that vision. I, I don't know what your what what argument you are making here now, Bill, because now you agree with me that the China China's idea as a civilization <laughs> has existed since since a millennium, since time immemorial. And all these intellectuals, I agree with you, there's all intellectual carry on this tradition, you know, throughout time of China as a universal empire. And right, I agree with you that might 
be different. Okay. The elite discourse might might be very different from what's reflected on the ground in like in the villages. I agree with that. But you know, the idea, the intellectual tradition, you know, since thousands of years, that was carried on. The idea of China was carried on through the writing system, right? Through the Confucian classics, and 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 that that the whole gen, every generations of intellectuals for the last two thousand years have been inoculated with this idea that. You know, ch this is the idea of China. We're talking about ideas here. Your book is talking about ideas. That's what we're talking about. But it wouldn't have applied in Tibet or Xinjiang or Mongolia or Manchuria, no? Well, Tibet, uh, Xinjiang, uh, Mongolia, they were recent acquisitions by the Qing dynasty, right? But the, as I mentioned, the, the, there was the, a, there Asia. was a China, China. The concept of China is evolving, right? So, so like, in like, like, like for example, yeah. you know, no, your your idea, your England, right? England, England obviously has gone through its own evolutions. We are talking about Battle of Hastings, you know, conquest by the by the Norman French military elite, right? I mean, very similarly, the Manchus are being mm. a conquering elite, a military elite that came in to conquer everybody, but then they in turn, they transformed the idea of what China is. They transformed China oh. into a multi, idea of a multi-ethnic state, and that idea filtered down to the Han literatis, and no, that's the idea. That's your mistake, because you've got to get to grips with Pamela Crossley's idea of simultaneous rule. In Tibet, they pretended to be one thing. In Mongolia, they pretended to be the Khan. In Manchuria, they pretended to be the Bele. Okay, and uh, in the, you know they pretended to be a sort of a, a benign leader to the Muslims, and they had a different face for the former Ming realm. So they had five different ways of presenting themselves depending on who they were talking to at the time. Exactly, but you know what? I read Pamela Crossley, and I think Pamela Crossley, the, the the whole idea of new Qing history is a good antidote to the traditional Sinocentric narrative. But Pamela Crossley took it a little bit too far. Right, because the, the the Manchu rule itself is an evolving project. It's an evolving enterprise. In the beginning, yes, I agree with you. The, you know, Manchu basically present they play this uh, put on different hats when they're ruling different parts of their empire. But just by the sheer fact of the majority subject population is the Han Chinese in their empire, and and their the Han Chinese became the the. The became the main backbone to staff the imperial bureaucracy, right? The imperial idea of what China is. I already mentioned, you know, Manchu, they had a name for their realm. They call it Dulin Bai Gurum, which means central state, which is a direct transcription from the Chinese term. Well, Sengu. actually, I think, they, I think they used a different term. I think they used Da Guo. No, no, I'm talking about Manchu documents. In the Manchu official documents, they call it Dulin by Guru. This is this is well established. You can go go check out any scholar, uh, including scholars I, of I, New Qing history. I suggest a new book for your <laughs> reading list. Okay, a new book. Okay, so so my point is, the, I then the I as a Qing rule drags on the whole idea of China was transformed. That's my whole point of bring out the clip uh, by the, the lecture given by Kenneth Pomeranz was a lecture given in 2018. Okay, very recent, and Kenneth Pomeranz is. The, one of the top foremost sinologists in the United States. He knows what he's talking about. He incorporates some of these ideas from New Qing history. But as he pointed out, that the, I, the idea of China is a clearly evolving one. By the mid Qing, a lot of the Han literati officials have adopted the idea that uh, area like Xinjiang is actually part of Zongguo. And they talk about you know, how they would advise on how to administer Xinjiang. A lot of the idea of, of these Qin Han officials are being carried over through Republic of China and to the People's Republic of China. You know, the, the, the idea of, 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 of implementing direct rule, the idea of even sending immigrants over. And, and, this, and his idea was formulated in 1820s. That's way before any kind of European influence. So well, what I... Except for all the Jesuit missionaries who've been there for 200 years by then. Like I said, 
you know, China was never a closed off nation like it was portrayed in the West. And the Jesuits main goal purpose, they were to act as a middleman. They were hired hands. They were hired hands by the Emperor Kangxi to communicate with Russians because they're fluent in multiple languages. Right. I mean, I mean, they are hired hands by by the by the uh, by the Manchu Emperor. <laughs> so I think what we need to accept, Carl, is that China is a hybrid. It's a hybrid of uh, ideas from Asia and from the West. It's the mixing of these ideas, these ancient ideas and these modern ideas that come from outside. That's what produces modern China. And that's what my book is about. That, 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 I, don't, I, don't, I don't disagree with, you know, modern China has all, all incorporated all kinds of influences. I mean, I'm, not, I, I'm only disagreeing with specific points you made in the book. You, you made it seems like, you know, the, the idea of uh, uh, the, the continuous Chinese civilization for for past couple thousand years was a pure construction. I, I'm, I'm, I'm no, saying no, that I that's I not true. That. I never said that. In the book, I talk I, about how you can find the term Zhongguo on oracle bones. I talk about I, how it appears at different times in history and it has different meanings in each of these periods of history, and then how its meaning changes again in the late 19th and early 20th century. I, and you also talk about the Han, how the Han... Uh, uh, was constructed, right? Yeah, I mean, nobody called themselves Han before the Mongols, before the Manchus showed up. Oh, people call themselves Han. They don't call themselves oh, Han, too, but they call themselves Han. No, they didn't. They didn't. Even, even, the, even <clears throat> in, I just listened to your talk, you know, in, invention of Han race, you know, like you gave a few days ago. You actually cited a study saying that, you know, the Han, the, the term Han might be a of non-Han origin because, mm -hmm. you know, the Shanbei, the Shanbei, uh, they, when they, because they, um, they still, because they still view the, 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 the land of under former Han dynasty as Han. So, so when they conquer Northern China, they reintroduce that term Han to Northern China. We're talking about fifth century here. That's a well over like 1500 yeah. and then those, years ago. I mean, you got to remember that most of the people who've ruled China for the last thousand years have not been Chinese, yeah? The Qing were Mongols, yeah? Okay. The, uh, sorry, okay. the Qing were Manchu, the Mongols, you know, the Shanbei, all these people, for most of the last thousand years, you've had okay. people from Inner Asia ruling. Okay, so therefore sure. these names moved around Inner Asia. So it was an Inner Asian name for the people over there. It was basically like the British calling you know, their colonial subjects, you know, the natives. Or so, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, like Norman French conquer England. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I mean, this happened all over the world. You know, Norm, yeah. you know, Vikings went to England. The Norman French went, went to England. There's like, uh, you know, the, the, the Mongol Turkey conquest of Iran. I mean, this happens all over the world. It's not, it's not, uh, but, but, but those people eventually synthesize. You know, they may have not started out as being Chinese. That's, they started out as yeah. Asian. As, as they became ruler of the land of China, they themselves start to adopt the you know, Chinese saying, culture. Are you saying the Mongols became synthesized? The Mongols who stayed in China became synthesized. Oh, I mean, the, the most famous scholar, the most famous scholar in Min, late Ming Dynasty, you know, Bo Bi Jiang, he's one of the four scholars of Jiangnan. That's yeah. Jiangnan Sida yeah. Sai Zi, right? Bo Bi Jiang, he was descended from the family of Genghis Khan, yeah. right? But in late mean, nobody will consider him a Mongol because, because no, he, he adopted empire. the Chinese culture. He participated the in the Chinese empire civil was, service. He speaks Chinese. Empire. His family lived empire. in China for 300 years. The Mongol empire in the 13th century ruled from you know, Korea to Hungary. China was just one colony of the Mongol empire, yeah? I, I, I accept that? It didn't. Well, the Mongol well, Empire well, was well, not. Well, Kublai Khan established his uh, established Yuan Dynasty in China, right? And then that, that's that. a Chinese dynasty. He it's, called it, it's, but he didn't. This is the whole thing. He pretended to make it more legitimate for his subject peoples, but he remained. But what, what, what matter does does it matter if he's if his pretension is accepted by the people? You know, the Ming exactly. Dynasty. Who replaced the Yuan Dynasty? The Ming Dynasty founder Zhu Yuanzhang acknowledged 
the legitimacy of the Yuan Dynasty emperor. See, he said they <coughs> they inherited the ma mandate of heaven, but now the mandate of heaven has transferred to yeah. me. So, so these he acknowledged the legitimacy yeah. of the Mongol Yuan Dynasty. Yeah. I'm just saying that... Like, it's political legitimacy. It's a political tactic because he wants we're to be recognized as legitimate. Ideas. Well, you you seem to have this idea of immutable kind of uh, uh, like like you. But, I, I, like your opposite. idea is very confused, right? Because on one hand you say the race is a construction, everything is a construction. Yeah. At the same time, you 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 are saying like, oh, at one point they're not Chinese, so they can never be Chinese. I, I'm saying no, everything is the, uh, evolution. No, I'm saying of course, that of they're course the Manchus were the Mongol, not Chinese. The Mongol great state. The Mongol great state was not a Chinese great state. That's what I'm saying. What do you mean? It's not. I mean, okay, you can say that uh, Norman French uh, England is not an English state. I mean, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, you know, what what that means when you say China, it's not a Chinese state. It's not a a a a, a, a state that's influenced by Chinese culture. It's not a it's a state uh, ruled by according to Chinese custom. But on the ground, it is. I mean, on the ground, they still they still have civil service exams in, in <clears throat> China. What, in Hungary? Did they have them in Hungary and Central Asia? Well, Hungary and Central Asia was never part of Yuan Dynasty. There's a the Mongol Empire of, broke up way Mongol, before that. It was part the Mongol of the Empire way broke up into little pieces way before the Kublai Khan established Yuan Dynasty in Beijing. So, so like that, you know, Hungary they're they're not part of China. You know, they're they're not they're they're not part well, of the well, Chinese well, history. But this is the point. The point is that it was a Mongol state. Yeah. It was a Mongol state. It's a, sure, it's, it started as a Mongol state, sure. But as, as they settled down in China, started to rule in China, it's it's a it's a Chinese dynasty. No, and and that's the same. And and Mongol, in fact, in fact, the Mongols and the Manchus introduce the idea of multi-ethnic state to China. Yes. They are the yeah. ones who build up the foundation, the, the build up our understanding of China as a multi-ethnic state. So, so China today is uh, as much inheritor of the Yuan dynasty and Manchu Qin dynasty as the other dynasty. So, so you know, it's, so, a re, right? it's, an in, it's a reinvention. It's a turning inside out. It's the colonized China proper, if you want to call that, taking over a multi-ethnic Qin state. That's what happened. That's what the Republic tried to be. Okay, we we we. I think we agree to disagree here. Um, I I think we're we're arguing about like finer points. I mean, I I on, on, I think on the on the grander scheme of things, you know, I agree. You know, the the, the whole whole nation, the Western nation idea, you know, Western feelings idea of nation state and and territoriality, sovereignty did have an impact, did have influence on China. But my argument is. There's a long continuity in China of ideas of territory of the state. I mean, China has a statecraft dating through thousands of years. It has it has imperial civil exams for thousands of years. I mean, and British, French, all these modern states adopted their own civil service. Uh, from the idea of imperial service exam in China, so so you know China predates a lot of the European idea of nation state. That's what I'm trying to say. So you can't you can't fit the idea no. of China to the shoebox of European understanding what nation state should be. No, I think you know, you I think you'll have this. You have an idea that there's some kind of primordial China that's always existed. I say that. That, that's not true. It, it, it existed for three thousand years. I can say that. I mean, I mean, well, but before that, who knows? But for three thousand years, yeah, sure. What about, what, Yunnan province was that always part of it in the independent it's kingdom? Not, but Yunnan province exactly. became exactly. part of exactly. Yunnan province became part of China during the Kublai conquest of Yunnan, yeah. right? Yeah, and, the, and ever since yeah, the Mongols, ever since the Mongols, ever since yes, ever since the Yuan Dynasty conquered yeah. Yunnan, Yunnan had been part of China. So it's been part of China. Just, since, if you could just acknowledge that there isn't a single timeless China throughout history. And no, that there, there is a, a single timeless China, but there's a China contracted and expanded according to the different uh, era. It's not. It's a, you, know, you have to be a nationalist you know, to take that drug 
to believe that. How is this? How is this? A, how is this a drug? I'm saying the, the border of China contract expanded uh, uh, throughout the time, and the definition of China ev- different ev- states you know, came. evolved different over states time. Came. How, how can you deny that China exists? I mean, that's that's mind-boggling no, to me. Because it didn't call itself China. That's why. Because it, each each state had a different name. Each dynasty have a dynasty name, but it's in the official it documents, it's let's not call it a change. It's interchangeable. It a, when it's, it's interchangeable when they because you know official documents it did refer to their polity as Zongguo. Okay, I mean, no, they talking, called themselves by their state name. Okay, that's they, what they did themselves. both. They did both, Bill. Well, I read. I read those documents. I read. You've read, them, well. you've read all the original documents in the classical Chinese. I yes. Yes, the twenty-four annals are available. They're even available online. You can go read them. You can if you can read classical Chinese and and, and traditional script. It's not that hard. But right. thanks, thank you, um, thank you very much, Bill. I mean, like, is there anything else you like to uh, my audience to know? I mean, I think we we reach a point where we agree to disagree. Uh, but 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 I I actually well, I want to pick your brain a little bit about you know what do you think about modern state of PRC maybe before you we go we can have ask that question. Um, I think it needs to make up its mind whether it's nationalist or socialist, and rather than becoming national socialist. Okay, it, uh, Xiang Yu, do we have any questions coming in for for me and Bill? Uh, let me see. Hey, you guys, if you guys have any questions you want to ask um either Carl or Bill. I'm just gonna. I'll take questions for maybe the next thirty seconds. If none of them come in, then I guess we'll call it a day or night or whatever. Let's just kind but, of see what people. But say. anyway, thank you, thank you very much, Bill, for taking your time to you know give this talk and present your ideas and your book. Um, but you know, for people who are curious, uh, maybe you can go check out Bill's latest book. Latest yes. book. Uh, the invention of China, where he talks about everything is constructed. You know, the <laughs> idea of China is constructed, which I, I you know, th- there, there are points where I agree with him, but th- there are some points I think he gave way too much uh, credit to the Westerners, to the, to the Western no, no, influence. The whole book is about how Chinese intellectuals take these ideas and run with them, okay? It's all about Liang Qichao, Zhang Binlin, Sun Yat-sen, Huang Zunxian, it's Yan Fu, it's all about these yeah. giving these people agency. That's what I'm yeah. interested in. Yeah, but I, I, I have to let my audience know, very, today, modern China, average, as average Chinese people on the street, very few people will know Huang Zunxian, Yang Fu, you know, unless they're very, you know, like really hey. into history and stuff. Okay, and, and the, the, some the, questions. Okay, good, go ahead. One of them is question for Bill. If race does not exist and it's no, is a social construct, then why is it impossible to imagine that a Mongol ethnic ruler wasn't Chinese? Well, because the the person asking the question has used the words race and ethnic. There's clearly ethnic differences, but that's not doesn't mean a racial difference. Oh, great. I mean, doesn't that mean the Han could exist as an ethnic group since, you know, a couple yeah. thousand years? Well, no, well they, they can exist, you know, as a group. I mean, are, are the Hakka, are they Han? Carl, what would you say? Who, Hakka? Yeah, of course. They well, themselves so, I, that self-identify as Han, so that's good well, enough for well, me. Except in 1905, there was a debate. And initially, yes. the Hakka were classified as outside the Han. and then That was, by, was classified by who, Bill? Classified by who? By local gazetteer writers in Guangdong province. By Cantonese, yes, because Cantonese and Hakka had been fighting a war yeah. since for hundreds of years in Guangdong. So the Cantonese yeah. are accusing Hakka of being non Han, and Hakka accused Cantonese of being non Han. I mean, yeah. but both groups strongly identify, self identify as Han, right? So that's well, more important. Okay, and well, yeah, self identification is It was important. a political choice. It wasn't an ethnic choice, it was a political choice. I, I don't know what you mean by ethnic choice. I mean, bo- both groups self-identify as Han, so I think that's good enough for me. They chose politically in the context of 1905 to both claim the title, yes. The whole idea of ethnicity, nationality, race, I mean, like, this is all very politicized, okay? I mean, I mean, it is all very heavily political, but the, the fact that Hakka, Cantonese, both group self-identify as Han, that's good enough for me. 
that, yes, but they, it was a political choice. And in the same way that, for example, you know, some people might now claim that there's a Hong Kong nationality or a Hong Kong ethnicity. It's a political choice. That's definitely a cons- or that I mean, that's the clearest case of construction right yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. You know, but it's the, no more you different. You cannot than be more, even more clear than that because, you know, the, the, you know uh, in terms of culture, you know, what's the difference between, say, the people in Hong Kong across the border with uh, their Cantonese bread, bread and just across the border? I mean, they feel different. That's all because they feel different. What's the difference between sure. an English person and a Scottish person? You know, not much. Oh, well, now that you bring up um, England and Scotland, it actually, um, there's a question from one of the viewers, Noobface Leet or Noobface1337. He wants to know. Um, I'm just going to read what he wrote. Can you ask him, him I assume is Bill, can you ask him about him using his logic on the situation in Scotland and Wales? Yeah. I mean, if people want to be, you know, define themselves as Scottish or Welsh, you know, that's their choice and, and their right. So, um, uh, you know, it will, we'll have it, you know, we'll see. I mean, British was a constructed identity uh, when Scotland and England and Wales were united back in the 18th century. And, um, you know, we're in the you know, position now where there may be a, a split. Who knows? Okay. And um, another one is, what's the conflict between nationalism and socialism here? The Irish Republic movement had both nationalist and socialist ideas. Yeah. Well, I mean, national socialism together generally is a bad thing. When you line everybody up in kind of nations and then kind of tell them that they have to be the uh, the same, I mean that's you know okay, Nazi well, I Germany. Think, I, I think what he's saying is he's not speaking specifically of like Hitler's so-called national socialism, but like nationalism as in like you know pride in one's nationality and socialism. <clears> because <throat> we have to admit that the nationalism of oppressed groups of of oppressed peoples is much different from the nationalism of the oppressor nations. Yeah, but what happens when one becomes the other? So what's your take on the, you know, the Irish uh, nationalist movement? What does that mean? <laughs> I mean, uh, well, uh, what happened? Did we lost visual of Bill? Yeah, I had to open the door. Okay. Um, you know, I think that was a, uh, the, the qu- listener's question, right? You know, what do you think about the Irish... Uh, Irish nationalist movement that has a strong element of socialism, both element of socialism and nationalism. Uh, well, they never got into power to see what it looked like in, you know, in practice. You know. Any more question, uh, Xiang Yu? Yes. Um, this one viewer. Let me find. Uh, do, 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 do. I can't find the name anymore, but the question is, um, he wants to know Bill's definition of fascism. Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, I suppose a corporatist state, one with uh, in, tries to impose a homogenous identity on all its citizens, uh, doesn't tolerate dissent, authoritarian, non-democratic. Will that do? Oh, he's asking about your definition. If that's your definition, then I guess it does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and and we can stop at any time um, if you want to answer more. I'm just looking to see if there's any more um, questions. Actually, I have a question for Bill. Um, do you um, think no. Do you think the current PRC is uh, is a fascist state? Uh, I think it's showing some signs of heading in that direction. Yes. Yeah. Any more questions, Xiang Yu? Yes, I think one last one. It says, question for Bill. Now that he wants countries to be afraid of a country that's confused between nationalism and socialism, what about holding countries to account for their imperialism? Compensation for Bengal families by Hitler, Light, Churchill. Uh, how would you do that? Hmm. What do you do? Do you, do you add up the number of famine victims and divide by the number of people who, you know, worked on the railways? You know, what are you, what are you, what are you going to do? How are you going to decide who gets compensation for anything? What are you well, going to do mean, about migrant c- people? Countries that are victimized by imperialism are actively underdeveloped, you, you know, by, by the hyper-exploit, 
hyper exploitation, the um, export of capital and the, the plundering of natural resources and stuff. And it's not just something that, you know, ended overnight. I mean, we're not, I think it's, if we're just going to tally up the number of people, that's kind of a pointless argument because all those people are dead anyways. But it's like, <laughs> what do we do with these societies that ha- that are underdeveloped today because of this sort of past hyper exploitation? Uh, is China going to pay compensation for all the Zungars that it genocided? You know, everybody's I got. I don't know. know. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, on, so are, Carl, you, Carl, Carl. are you are you equating now? Are you acknowledging China is the same as the Qing Empire? Because you said China genocide is well, wrong. Well, Yeah, well, that's the whole point, isn't it? You know, if you're trying to sort of say that these nations collectively are responsible for things that people did in the past, you end up in a complete kind of quagmire, don't you? But but you just use the word China genocide is wronger. And I, I, I mm. remind my audience, you know, Qin Empire did commit genocide as against stronger. So you're basically equating Qin Empire with China. Well, no, what I'm saying is nowadays, if you were going to go do and go and do this, you'd have to basically say, well, who is the successor state? And I guess you'd have to say it was the People's Republic of China, wouldn't you? So, so you acknowledge so it makes sense. No, no, so you acknowledge that China PRC is a successor state of the Qing Empire? Oh, no, no. well, it's become that in the sense it rules the same territory. But what the whole book is about for Britain, though Britain doesn't have a successor state; it's still the same Britain, albeit with yeah, modified yeah, so, territories. Like you know, how you don't have the rest of Ireland anymore. Everybody, who, everybody who did it exactly, you know. So should the Irish chip in because they were part of the UK at the time? You know, should the you know, should the Commonwealth, you know, the, the the former imperial dominions chip in for the compensation? Well, because that's like they saying should Taiwan Duke? chip in for Japan's war crimes when Japan itself was victim victimized by yeah, its colonialism? It doesn't doesn't make any sense, does it? Okay, well, well, well um, you asked how um, compensation should be done. The the person who asked the question says he's Indian and that you can PayPal him. So, I'll, <laughs> yeah. Very funny. <laughs> okay, um, I think we'll, let's wrap it up, Xiang Yu. Um, it's been two hours, so thank you very much, uh, Bill, for taking your time and uh, uh, to 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 talk with us and to engage with us. I mean, you you, you didn't have to, but I appreciate the effort uh, to to have this dialogue. I do believe open discussion mm. and dialogue is important in terms of discussion of ideas, right? Especially in if we believe in you know open ideas and democracy and all that so so thank you bill for for me sure. yeah but I just, one, one point i just it suddenly struck me carl that you're kind of very much like an heir to these nationalists these chinese nationalists of a century ago because you're 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 an american expat living in bali aren't you and you know just in the same way that sun yat sen was uh, an expat living in hawaii and kang yo wei was an expat living in canada and liang chi was an expat living in uh, J- japan and, and you're all looking back at this country with a hybrid vision of what china's going to be so i see you as the kind of the heir to those kind of early republican you know movement activists i'm not trying to i'm not trying to overthrow government bill <laughs> 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 Fine. Okay. Maybe, maybe United States. Maybe maybe <laughs> U.S. I do. I do demand regime change in U.S. <laughs> but not not but not China. So so thank you, thank you, Bill, for again for for coming to the show. And uh, we had a. I feel we had a very fruitful uh, exchange. And uh, oh. hopefully, hopefully your book sells a lot. So Excellent. all the best. Cheers. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, uh, Xiang Yu, you got all that? Can we sign off now? Yeah, you wanna you wanna get, get, have some like last words? Um, I mean, if unless there's any uh, new questions coming in for me specifically, I think I cover most of the ground. I mean, I I, I do appreciate uh, Bill agreeing to do this debate online, and he he really didn't have to. Um, I I just the reason why I want to do this debate is because. I feel a lot of this idea has been floating around um, kind of uh, a, 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 a lot of times it serves to serve up this narrative that somehow uh, the China, the modern state of China is illegitimate, whatever that means. And uh, and, and I, I wanted to poke holes in some of these narratives. And, and 
And some of the ideas that Bill presented was actually not new. There, uh, as he mentioned, was from the new Qing history school. Uh, that was a new field of study in the in academia in the last you know 30, 40 years. You know, mostly started from um, you know Western scholars being able to read Manchu documents in the imperial archives. Um, and again, I do believe some of these ideas are useful to challenge the traditional Sinocentric view of history by presenting kind of the Manchu perspective. But at the same time, uh, I, I do think sometimes it, it goes overboard, uh, especially Pamela Crossley's work. <laughs> uh, there, there are some other scholars that, that do great work, which I, I cited, you know, Mark Elliott, uh, uh, Peter Perdue, et cetera. Um, but the idea, especially, Taking the idea that uh, the Qing, because it was um, it was a non Han uh, ethnic group that came to dominate all of China, so the Qing Empire is not really China. I, I mean, I think I through this talk I show that the idea of uh, Qing Empire and China gradually fused into one. You know, throughout. You know, 260 years of Qin rule. Um, you know, especially built by the mid Qin. Certainly by 1800s, um, a lot of the Han literati officials started to think of all the territory of Qin Empire as China, as Zhongguo, and they they express that explicitly in the documents. And I feel like Bill's book didn't give enough emphasis on that development. Uh, instead, he talked. He mostly concentrated on uh, the Chinese intellectual during the late Qin era, after the Sino-Japanese War, you know, is uh, after 1890s. Um, yeah, there are a group of small radicals who were influenced by the Western ideas of nation-state, uh, you know, also on uh, race and ethnicity, and uh, and specifically, you know, they use try to use the uh, Han nationalism to overturn the Qin imperial government, right? Because Qin was established uh, by Manchu, so they found the Han nationalism to be a very useful tool to rally the public to 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 overthrow the government, right? But but after they after the Qin Empire was actually overthrown, the people who actually came to power very quickly throw out all these Han nationalist ideas and and reverted back to the Qin's uh, recognition that this realm is a multi-ethnic state. So, so I, I wanted to emphasize that uh, it, it's true that there is also was in additional influence from the Soviet influence under the PRC that you know China is populated by a, a multiple you know supposedly fifty six officially recognized ethnic groups uh, and and PRC is a officially multi ethnic state and and I feel like a lot of the narratives in in the West now kind of equates. Han ver with Chinese, which is kind of imprecise name, uh, preciseness of the English language. Because in Chi in Chinese, you know, we talk about Han as uh, ethnicity, you know, like, but we also talk about Zhongguo as the kind of ethnic neutral term. Like, uh, uh, Zhongguo is uh, is does not is not tied. That term does not tie to any ethnicity. In fact. You know, the Qin Empire themselves use that name to refer to yeah. their their realm. That's I wanted right. to add. I wanted to add when we were talking. Like I, I know I brought up Stalin's um, Marxism and the National Question, and I'm just um because okay, we keep on saying social construct, but with these things we need to have definitions, right? So then, if we work with his definition, oh, a nation is you know a group of people with a common ex common cultural experience, common territory, common language, and all of that. So. That's, I think we can reconcile why nowadays we have this concept of the Zhonghua Minzu. It's because with the founding of, with, with the creation of New China and in the 21st, 20th and 21st century with the different national groups interacting more or less, like interacting more with each other and, you know, intermingling, it, there emerges a new um, sort of common culture, common language. I mean, everyone speaks standard Mandarin um, as either as the lingua franca it might not be their first language but it's there you know common economic activity common you name it common history so yeah. i guess it does 
I can see what he's trying to get at, like you know how in the yeah, past yeah. they used to say Zhongguo Renmin more so than Zhonghua Minzu. But at the same yeah. time, I can I can see both perspectives, and um, yeah, it's of course. it's kind of like people in the chat are saying right now: languages are alive, um, cultures are alive, nations, states, um, ethnic groups, and all that. It's all alive, and they're constantly changing and evolving. So I, I mean, mean, do we really yeah, have to I, be that? Um, just when we're just arguing semantics saying oh this is that because yeah. and, and, and you see what happened you know he was like um china's not china because it used to be this and because the ching were manchus but but did you see what he did at the end he said well, what about china uh, uh genocide of the the, the Zhuanggar? so i'm like wait 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 <laughs> now you are equating the Qing empire to china whereas you, you deny the link before so basically all the bad things that that, that Qing empire did that was china's fault but you know hey, china the US is no longer claim. white supremacist because um, obama was president yeah i mean it's it's like i i yeah, I, I, I mean, I mean, I actually have his book. I started reading the, the, you know, first part of it. I, I, I didn't finish, but I think I got the gist of his idea, and I also listened to his talks, um, you know, with other, like, book, on his book promotion tour. Uh, I listened through to three hours of it, so I'm pretty sure I got a good idea what he was trying to trying to get through. And I do want to challenge these ideas because I think it's important. A lot of time, especially in the Eng English language media, kind of the it's it's a westerns. Uh, Westerners history of China that's been presented and I, I wanted to you know let people know like yes we we actually have our own ideas <laughs> what China is about and I think sometimes they're they're impose their own idea of what China should be because halfway th through I'm thinking like people like Bill they, they seem seem to think that China should just be a be a Han ethno state. <laughs> I mean, like, like, like that sounds like the argument they're making, right? If 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 the Yuan Dynasty was established by by Mongols and it's not really Chinese, if if the Qin Dynasty was established by by Manchus and it's not really Chinese, so what you're saying is China should be a Han ethno state. I mean, is is that is that what you're trying to say? I mean, I I'm confused. It's it's funny because if you asked him if um the Black Belt. And what is the United States today deserves um, autonomy and the option of independence. I'm not sure what he would support. I wish I wish people asked those questions, man. <laughs> but you know, like this is an odd time. I know most of my yeah. followers are probably from the West, so it's it's late over there. So anyway, we're, we're gonna upload this video to YouTube, and you know, people are are more than welcome to go comment there. So so it will be uploaded on my my youtube channel so search for carl za um i think what you what what is uh let me see maybe we'll post the channel if they're, see, my YouTube if they're seeing this um then they're already on your youtube channel oh okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah so, so um, I'll, I'll just yeah yeah so it was um a good stream today i think next time we're gonna have pug me on <laughs> yes 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 let's let's get that let's get that he has she hasn't responded yet i'm so disappointed we need to get more uh, people to um okay if you're watching this you need to i'm just going to turn this into a separate video eventually you need to yeah. look at carl Zaz's um post inviting pagya me to a debate and then screenshot it or whatever or retweet it and tag her or screenshot yes. it and then post it on Instagram and then tag her there or slide into yes. a DM or something. We're, we're going to make the yes. debate happen. Yes, let's make it happen, guys. Let's, yeah, let's, I would really want to see. It, uh, it will be a, a debate be, between Park Yong Mi and you, between you and uh, between Xiang Yu and Park Yong Mi, not me, because Xiang Yu actually has family background in Korea and stuff. So, so that's what I, we like to see. Anyway, just to make that clear. So, all right, can we wrap it up, sir? All right.